Another edition here of Getting There with Gons, where we talk about the career journeys of athletes, coaches, business owners, media members, and more from upstate New York. And we are breaking the rules, kind of, sort of, with this one. I've harassed poor Barry Gadboys for months on social media. I've been shooting him direct messages at 1.30 in the morning saying, come on the show, please. I need to hear about your story. He counts because he worked at Albany for a quick cup of coffee at one point in the news world. So we're counting this as an upstate New York connection. Barry Gadboys, for those who don't know you, let's go back to a younger version of you. Six, seven, eight years old. Where'd you grow up? What'd you want to be as a kid? And was it your same dream job you wanted when you were 18 years old? You know, I well, I grew up in Western Mass. Um, so I was born in Springfield, grew up in Holyoke. Um, it, you know, when I was a kid, I think I wanted to be a cop. And now that I'm 41, I wish I had been a cop because I, you know, I'd probably be close to retirement instead of uh, having bounced around the media and a couple other things and made no discernible plans for what to do with my life after I'm no longer useful. So <laughs> I, I probably, it was actually probably a good plan and I diverted from it uh, and got sort of siphoned off into the world of broadcasting and TV and all this other stuff, which was fun, uh, if not always profitable. So, so you want to be a cop? You're 18 years old. Uh, what do you want to be? Is it still a cop? Is it a job in media? What are you doing when you're 18? And what is that college process like for you? Well, so here's, I tell people all the time when I, when I talk about my career, my career has been just a series of like, like it's like a, a chain reaction accident on the freeway. It's just been like an accident that never stopped happening. Um, I, was, I was in the seventh grade when a kid that I went to school with said we should go to the public access station where we li where I was in Westfield and we should do like a news show aimed at kids. And I was an opinionated jerk even at like 13 years old. So I was like, oh, I'll do some kind of an opinionated jerk thing on the on the kids news show. And I think we probably did like two episodes of the kid news show did not last long. Everybody fell off, but I kind of fell in love with it. I felt like the tech was cool. I felt like I was doing something that you know, at that time it was, it, we didn't have what we have now, cell phones, video and all that stuff wasn't as accessible. So that was cool. I also made a very clutch discovery, which was that there were college girls interning where I was showing up to do this show. So I was like, this place is awesome. I want to hang out. These people are fun. <laughs> we're doing cool stuff. I'm kind of learning something. So everybody else kind of fell off and I stayed on. Like I became sort of a quasi intern and I would show up like a couple days a week and work on city council meetings and stuff like that. And eventually I, I hung around long enough that they sort of made me when I was old enough, a part-time employee. And I made like six bucks an hour to, you know, direct the mayor's talk show or whatever the, you know, the gig was at the time. And so I, as a kid, I sort of backed into this thing that I thought I was pretty good at and it was kind of fun. And, and honestly, you know, when you're making like six bucks an hour, you th it, it would seem like an incredible amount of money when I would get this, you know, this paycheck for like $200. I was like, oh my goodness, I'm set for life. I've got this skill. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I really, by the time I was 18, I was a terrible student. Um, I had virtually no interest in school except to occasionally play some sports or hang out with people. And, um, but I was already working at WGGB TV in Springfield. They hired me to work the night shift. So I would go to school and then I'd show up at the TV station at like three o'clock. I could only work till 10 by law. So I had to cut out at 10. I couldn't stay for the 11 o'clock news. But by that time I was making what I thought was real money and I loved what I was doing. And I thought I was just so smart that I didn't need any kind of, you know, education or anything like that. I had it all figured out. Um, so you know, by the time I was 18, I, I thought, I don't know, I guess I thought I was going to shoot news at WGGB in Springfield forever. I, I had no plan beyond that and maybe trying to acquire some illegal beer along the way. That was really it. <laughs> That's right. Finding those hookups. I think it was Michael Scott of the office that said, you know how to go to business school? LeBron James, Kevin Garnett, Tracy McGrady. <laughs> but I bring up that quote just because that feeling of making money when you're a teenager doing something that you like the easy comparison is you've already gone pro, which like it's completely true. There are so many people that are trying to find that foot in the door job, that internship, that college credit to do what you're doing and you're already doing it and you're doing what you love. So even though college isn't your route post senior year in high school, you kind of shrug your shoulders at points when you're a teenager, probably like, well, this is this is what I want to do anyways. Yeah, it's, you know, two two things happen. One of them was that I, I mean, I just wasn't that bright and I didn't have a very long vision and I just thought I had to figure it figured out. But secondarily, and I, I say this all the time, my whole 
career such as it is has been the result of people uh there's a guy named tony gordon who was a really great engineer who worked at continental cable vision and here I, you know there were people who worked there I, and now i'm i'm even more aware of it who probably thought i was this annoying kid that shouldn't be there but there were people like tony who were like hey this kid wants to learn i'm gonna show him some stuff when he asks a question i'm gonna answer it and so now you know in my 40s and sort of advanced in my career you know technically and journalistically and whatever i feel like man i got a responsibility to kind of give back to other people because you know one of the things not to not to divert too much but one of the things that's happened is as media has sort of collapsed down right i mean you, when i when i started in the media business you'd work in springfield and then you might go to albany or providence and then you know if you really ground it out for like 15 years you might get to work in boston it was stratified and there were entry level opportunities and places you go on those places don't exist anymore people go into you know markets like boston and they are coming straight out of college they don't have a lot of street knowledge and they don't have necessarily all that technical knowledge that's applicable to you know their day-to-day job so i i think it's important in in the technical industry to give back and and frankly part of the reason that i've been able to support myself is because people did that for me when i was a kid who knew nothing and so it's it's one of the coolest parts of things for me is that i you know i really i mean i put in some sweat equity but a lot of other people kind of put a hand out and said all right kid you know show you how it works and you know if you can run with it you could run with it so you, you teased me Albany right there, because even though you mentioned that the world is changing a little bit from when you find those entry level jobs post college, even though it's Massachusetts to start, you do bounce around a little bit post professional, I guess I'll call it here post 18 year old, you do find some opportunities in other markets. Yeah, so I I, I threw a, a friend of mine who was working at WTEN, um, got an opportunity to come work at WTEN. I, I sort of ended up in an odd, I really wanted to be an, a shooter. I want to shoot news at that point, but I had skills where I could operate the live truck. And so I kind of went into the interview and I sort of sold the skill set that I didn't actually want to use to some extent, got hired to be like the live truck guy who occasionally got to go shoot a basketball game or something like that, which was fun. Um, and so I, you know, I started, I think in like September of uh, it must have been September of 2000. I started, and and by the end of December, uh, one of the last things I did, I remember doing the Schenectady Christmas Parade in 2000, and I I just remember being so cold that like you, they, you couldn't feel your fingers. I couldn't feel my elbow, and so <laughs> I I had a chance to go at that point to go to California to do a, a like a freelance gig that was a corporate thing and i had at that point in time i hadn't done very much corporate stuff but i'd done a few things and i had a couple connections and so i got this you know it was i think it was a couple weeks where i got to live at the ritz carlton in laguna and work on this corporate gig and um you know never being super forward thinking i was like you know what i'm not sure that albany is it for me because i'm it's very cold not sure that I've gotten myself into the right position here. And I sort of, I sort of backed out of WTE and left a full-time job to go to California um, where I, I did a little freelance gig. I put some money away. I had whatever I could fit in my Ford Ranger with a big fish naked bumper sticker on the back, um, blasted out to California, bounced around for a little while. And then I, I accidentally became a military contractor while I was out there. So I, I had met a girl at the time and one of her friends was a, was a chiropractor, really nice guy. And he said, oh, I'm telling him what I do. And he goes, oh, you should meet this friend of mine who works out at Fort Irwin uh, for the army. And I'm thinking, I'm not really, not really sure what I can contribute to the army necessarily. I mean, can't run very well. Uh, you know, I, I haven't killed anything recently, but so I, I met this guy and I, the Fort Irwin is a really cool place. It's, it's a, it's in the uh, Mojave Desert, kind of between, um, you know, if you look at the map, like where the 15 and the 10 meet north of Los Angeles, this thing, Fort Irwin's bigger than the state of Rhode Island. It's huge. And mm -hmm. so it's the only place in the country we could do force on force tank battalion level drills and all this stuff. Um, and and a, it took a lot of communications gear and video gear and audio gear to sort of capture all the training. And then the trainers would, you know, go into effectively meetings with the soldiers and review what happened, look at video, look at data. So, you know, they were like, basically offered me a job at, at this first meeting. Um, and it was, at that time, it was more money than I ever 
thought that I could possibly make. And I, it's like, I was like, I mean, sure, I'll do anything you want. So I, within a couple months had transitioned from shooting the Schenectady Christmas parade to now I'm living in Southern California in Barstow, which is a place most people look at you because they say, well, it's either military or you're incarcerated. There's no other reason that you would be there. <laughs> um, and, and all of a sudden that turned into like a three and a half year detour where I was out in Southern California. Um, I was doing that job on 9-11, which was it really, uh, it's, it's amazing how much that job transitioned. You know, when I started in, in early 2001, we were still running, you know, like Soviet era tank battle drills and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden 9-11 happened and, and we were on the cutting edge of, you know, training people who were going to make their next stop in Iraq and Afghanistan at that time, it got really heavy. Um, you know, and, and it, some of it got political, um, but I met some of the greatest people that I could ever have imagined. And I got the greatest education um, from the U.S. Army in leadership, accountability, communication. The Army is the most diverse workforce in the world. Um, it's it's such a cool um, community. And I, I that experience was incredible. I loved, that, loved it. Yeah, that transition from media to a non-media job. And the opportunities you're given and the experience and the, the real workforce, if you want to use the word real for media members, you'll know what I'm talking about, especially like a real job if you want. But that transition from the, the capital region to that, when you were talking about shooting games and shooting that, some younger listeners might be a little confused by what you're talking about because now everybody's a one-man band. You might right. see a local multimedia journalist out there and then on the news later on. Did you see potentially that trend happening of the job I'm doing right now may not exist five or 10 years from now because of budgets and television? Yeah, I, I think that was the it was the very beginning. You know, it's it's interesting because at that time in the media, you know, we would we would especially the, the people who had been the veterans would say, well, you know, back in we would do this with a four man crew. We'd have a sound guy. We had a guy running the truck. We had, you know, for why a tape guy you had a, the deck was so big, a guy had to carry the deck and then another guy had the camera. And so, you know, the, the people factor had been going down for a long time. And you know, especially in Springfield, when I worked at in Springfield, it, the station that I worked at got bought by Sinclair Broadcasting. And Sinclair at that time was like on the leading edge of the wave of how could, you know, we do more with less. Can the director do the chirons and roll the tapes? And, you know, I mean, if you had one more arm, you could also do whatever. So, it, you know, that was the beginning of it. And I, I think it also, you know, you go through, I, I loved my career in in media i did i tell you all the time i went to a super bowl a world series nba finals nhl finals presidential debates national political conventions um i i would never do it again i you gotta love it and you gotta want to do it every second of every day otherwise it's just it's just gonna eat you alive um it, but it's not a job where you know except for a few people you're not going to make a lot of money uh, if you have a family, it's the hours are terrible. You're going to miss a ton of stuff. Um, and it's super unpredictable. You just, you know, the phone rings and you go for 12 hours or two days or whatever the, whatever the assignment is. So, you know, and, and the more that you could see the levels collapsing down, you know, you started to see even on air people, you start looking at anchors and say, man, that guy's the last guy who's going to make a contract like this, you know, in a market like this. And it's, it, you could just see it kind of winding down. I, I, it's accelerated faster than I ever thought that it would. And I, the, the MMJ thing to me, you know, it's fine. If you want to, especially in the sports department to send somebody out to cover a, a game or whatever is fine. I think it's crazy when I watch local news and I see young people in a position of having to, you know, go to a crime scene, maybe a rough neighborhood, maybe an active scene, and they're trying to set up a live shot, edit a story, park a vehicle, you know, feed tape in, make contact with the station, get in front of their camera, frame up their shot. It's crazy. And, it, it, you know, there was a, a thing I don't, a couple months ago where you saw a girl who was doing a traffic live shot actually get hit by a car that came off the road. And it was crazy video. Thank God it was low speed and she was totally fine. But I really can't believe that the MMJ trend of sending people out to cover breaking news solo, I honestly can't believe it hasn't gotten somebody more seriously hurt at this point. I think it's it's crazy when I see it. 
I thought that video was going to be the end of it, or at least there would be like a call to like, this is not safe anymore. Not only is it hurting the content that's presented, but it's actually putting people in harm's way. And look, maybe by the time this airs, maybe there will be change. Who knows? Like when, maybe by the time you're listening to this, this is what I like to call evergreen content. Maybe you listen to this in 2023 <laughs> and something has changed. Uh, we mentioned you have the military based job out in California. You've got a media background. Is there a thirst, a desire to get back into media, even though you're doing this job that's paying you more than you could have imagined and things are going well? What is happening, whether it's the heart or the head for Barry Gadboys that's telling you, okay, maybe this media thing is not quite over yet for me? So it's it's actually interesting. I never really have uh, – there's not a lot of people that I've talked about this with before. But when, um, you know, when we – the invasion of Afghanistan took place and, and then Iraq followed – we had we created a training section there um and i assume this 20 years ago so I, i'm not telling anybody anything that's i hope a state secret if you if this goes dead if the feed goes dead i'll know that i went outside the bounds but we created we actually created a group that was designed to train soldiers to interact with the media because if you remember you know when we went into afghanistan you had you know cnn and and nbc people riding along actively as the invasion force moving into Afghanistan. So we train soldiers how to, you know, properly interact with the media, what information you should give and not give and how you should decline and give and all that stuff. So they were looking for somebody to head up that section, this new section of, of the training uh, center. And I, I really want, I thought, man, I'm the right, I got this media background, which at that time I thought I had done a lot or had done nothing at that point, but I, I, you know, I felt like I had a lot of passion for it and I had a lot of real world knowledge that I could bring to it. Um, I lost out to another person who actually in the end, smarter than I am probably did a better job, <laughs> but I felt like I kind of hit a brick wall all of a sudden. Um, and I, I, on a whim, I sent my resume to New England Cable News in Boston. They had an opening for a satellite engineer. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, my mom had been going through some health stuff. And I thought maybe it's time to go home. I don't know. Maybe California is not where it's at for me. So I, I literally sent my resume off blindly. Um, and I got a phone call back like a day later from a guy named Dave Beauvais, who turned out to be one of the best bosses I ever had at New England Cable News. And he basically said, 2004 Democratic Convention is coming up in Boston. Um, you know, you work for the government. You have a government clearance. I know that you can get credentialed. I know that you're, you know, you you have the skills that you have. Uh, I, I basically never met him until I started work. They offered me, they offered me a job, and I said, all right, it's time to go. I transitioned back to Boston, and I started, I started uh, basically running a satellite truck, um, which was, you know, now in the era of backpacks and MMJs is kind of crazy, but like 16, 17 years ago, I was driving a giant 26 foot box truck around Boston, um, <laughs> which was, it was insane. It was actually nuts. I can't believe that I, I really, I'd never had any kind of an accident or anything like that. I had some close calls, um, but it was nuts, uh, but it was fun. I mean, we chased, you know, I, I got back into the breaking news game. I worked the night shift. So we were, you know, and doing the cable news really covered from Maine, you know, Rhode Island, Connecticut. We even kind of touched some things in the capital region at times and, and down to New York City. Um, so, it, you know, it was I was back in like seven days a week. Couldn't get enough of it. I eventually managed to get myself promoted to like news operations manager. I was there for I was there for almost nine years, the longest day that I ever had anywhere. Um, and so I was in that position, Comcast. When when I started NECN, it was an independent cable network. Hearst Broadcasting owned half and Comcast owned half, which is to say neither one of them cared what we did. So we <laughs> we did stuff in TV that we, we would do like three and a half, four minute packages, which now, I mean, 40 seconds is like a long package, but we did longer form stuff. Um, I think a lot of it mattered. I think we did we did news in a way that nobody else was doing it at the time. But then Comcast bought out Hearst fifty percent, which ultimately, you know, sort of brought us into the Comcast Sports Group. We sort of partnered up with Comcast Sportsnet and you know started to get closer to Celtics coverage. And all of that was leading towards what nobody knew at the time: Comcast buying NBC. And all of a sudden, New England Cable News went from being this like tiny little as we used to say, America's most honored regional news network to now we were like an NBC O and O. It was, it was a crazy ride for a couple of years. Um, and I kind of got to a point where I, I knew that 
the NBC folks were going to make some huge changes, which all came. Uh, and I felt like I was going to get off the ride before they decided to just tell me to get out of my chair. And I ended up going back into into corporate events and, and working on corporate events full time uh, in 2013. Um, and it was, you know, it's it, like I said, my life, just a chain reaction series of accidents, right? The right things happened at the right time. I, I've almost never had a day in my career when I didn't kind of enjoy what I did, have fun. I very rarely wake up and, and drag my ass to work because I don't want to go. Like it just, I, I enjoy what I do. And when it stops being fun, you find something else. You've got good instincts. The Gad Boys brothers, I'll give credit to your brother, Dan, as well, because I've said this to him before. The, the instincts, whether it's business or media, you smelled something coming like, okay, more responsibilities, buyouts, moving parts. I'm getting off before they let me go. And I think your instincts were spot on on making that decision. Uh, before we kind of make that transition, because the media ride's not done yet. You keep hopping on and off because those instincts are telling you where to move next. I got to go back to the DNC because for some people, whether you're a political reporter, you work in news, whatever your job may be, when you see whether it be the Democratic National Convention or the Republican National Convention, I guess for a lack of a better description, because you've covered a Super Bowl before, it is the Super Bowl for many journalists to cover. And if you're watching from your house, even if you're not even a huge political scientist or you're not even following politics, when you watch these events, you're like, what is happening? It looks like chaos out there. But a fun, controlled chaos of, man, I kind of want to be at that party right now, whatever, I guess, party pun intended, whatever that party may be. Oh, yeah. Take us through it. You're the first person who I've got the opportunity to talk to about covering a convention. Oh, four in particular, what was it like being there on the floor in the mix of having these moments happen in politics? Oh, four was it was it was pretty crazy. Um you know, it was it was only you got to go back and remember, it was only less than three years post 9-11. So, um, you know, we had been told that there were credible threats against the convention and against the media. We actually hired, you know, security. We had private security that we traveled with around the city. Um, and it was pretty, you know, it, it, at that point, um, you know, move on dot org uh, had sort of come to prominence. And there was a lot of angst already about Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and so, um, you know, by the time this thing came to Boston, Boston, there was all this concern that like the city was going to be gridlocked and noisy. Boston evacuated. I mean, the city was, there was nobody in town. There were cabs and there was media and there were people in limousines and that was it. There was nobody in town. It was really weird. And they were, they were in the, in the middle of the, the sort of last phase of the big dig. So when you were outside TD garden, they were still like these big concrete structures from where the big, from where the uh, the central artery went overhead and turned around the garden. And there, uh, there was a big controversy because they put like these fences and nets around these, and that was called the free speech zone. And so anybody who was going to protest had to like basically go into this pen across the street from the arena and be content. And it was real. I mean, it was super contentious so that it was weird being on the street. Cause you would go, I remember doing a red hot chili peppers played a, a John Kerry benefit at this place called Louis Boston. It's like upscale clothing store on Newberry street. And so you're, I mean, you're on Newberry street doing interviews with, you know, I, I don't you know, all these like super rich, some famous and, and literally on the other side of the fence, the red hot chili peppers are playing a concert for like, 80 people you know <laughs> um there was there was i forget who plays a big party at rose wharf but all of that stuff you know it's a circus i mean to your point it is a party and it takes over the the whole city um you know barack obama spoke in 2004 and a lot of us who heard that speech were like that guy might be president someday whether you like his politics or you don't like it you were like holy cow this dude is something and in 2008 i actually was at Mile High Stadium in Denver when he gave the the acceptance speech for 2008 nomination, which was, 2008 was so different than 2004. 2004 to me felt dark. Like there was just a, like this sort of, you know, post 9-11, beginning of the protest age, security concerns, like weird cloud over the whole convention. It felt very, it just felt dark. Everybody felt like they were on edge the whole time. 2004 really to me, it didn't feel like a party inside or outside. It was very, very, just a weird time. That 2001 to 2005 was like a weird time. Um, and then fast forward to 2008 and Denver was an insane 
party. In 2008, I went to the Democrat convention in Denver and I went to the Republican convention in Minneapolis. And that was a weird year because the Republican convention got shortened. It was post Katrina. Uh, I can't remember the hurricane, but a big hurricane hit New Orleans. So the Republicans started the convention late and like truncated the schedule in Minneapolis. The days were like super long. A lot of the partying kind of got set aside. Um, but I, you know, I got to hear Barack Obama's speech and then John McCain's acceptance speech in Minneapolis. And I mean, to your point, it, it, it definitely, it's cool. It's intoxicating to be like on the on the front step of these events when they're happening it's like it's exhausting because you know i mean especially when you work at, at like local or regional media you're not like you're skipping meals you're starting at five six in the morning and going till one or two the next morning when you file your thing for the morning show and um you know you do all your own legwork you, and, and i can't imagine to be honest i have no idea what it's like now for local and regional reporters trying to cover these things because i'm sure they don't have the kind of technical support and shooters and editors and stuff that we had it was insane like it was it was hard to do it in 2004 and 2008 i can't imagine what it's like now other than if you love it you know and you love having that front row seat there's nothing nothing beats it you know no and and it really doesn't because like you hear this phrase almost overused in media that i was there for a history making moment or history was when it comes to the convention, that is 100% true. Like, you are there witnessing history for our country, whether it's the Democratic side or the Republican side. You are there. You could tell your grandkids, like, I watched that future president talk or I, I had, watched this person. It's amazing. <laughs> I had my biggest moment probably ever in media was at Pepsi Center in Denver. Um, cause it's, you know, it's funny in the, in the back hallways and in the skyboxes, you know, you're at the democratic convention, but I, I actually met and talked to Rudy Giuliani, super nice guy. Um, and then all of a sudden there was all this speculation that Mitt Romney was going to be McCain's running mate in 08. And so a photographer named Mike Bellwin and I were just walking through Pepsi center and I see governor Romney headed into the stairwell. And I was like, give me the mic, give me the mic, give me the mic. So we caught up with him. I said, Hey governor, you got time for a couple quick. And I'm just, you know, I'm just engineer Barry, but I was like, governor, you got time for a couple of questions. How about this vice presidential speculation? So I did this like 45 second little walk and talk with Romney. And, uh, it, it, it went kind of big. It was all over the place after we, you know, after we turned it in. So that was like my, that was my like one minute of relevant political reporting in my life. I got this one-on-one -on -one out of nowhere with Romney, who is, uh, and I've, I've, it's funny. I've actually run into him a few times since my news career is over. He actually remembered me is one of the nicest, most approachable people on the planet, like just a genuinely good guy. And it's no more evidence than the fact that he stopped for like a minute in the middle of the presidential campaign to talk to some dumbass, literally in a pair of shorts <laughs> with a microphone, you know, but that was my, that was my one minute of fame. The thing when that happens, even though it's a great moment, it's, it's wonderful for your career. You're talking to governor Romney. If you think about what it would have been 10 years later or 15 years later and how many views it would have gotten on social media and what it would have done and your phone and email and we joke around about your direct message, it would have been a different world 10 or 15 years later with that interview happening. I want to get to the power of social media and Twitter and all that stuff in a second, but I, I got to reset the storyline here a little bit of your career because you told us it was going to be all over the place because we've touched on television, we've touched on news. But I feel like we haven't hit the trifecta quite yet to cash our ticket at Saratoga for radio because radio still pops in your career at some point here coming up in the early 2010s. Yeah, so I, I it's funny. I was just talking with um, a friend of mine named Margaret McLean, who has written a couple of really good books, one about the Whitey Bulger Trash, the former prosecutor, uh, and she was doing podcasting and and then radio at the same time that Cameron Robbins and I started doing. And we I really our whole radio career started because we were at a bar one night and we were talking about whatever we we're talking about. And somebody was like, man, you guys should have a radio show. And I was like, ah, it's always been, you know, go back to literally as a kid, I used to have a, a, a cassette deck and, uh, and there was a guy named Dan York, who I think is still on WPRO in Providence, who was on WNNZ in Springfield. And I used to listen to him. And then, uh, you know, I was probably, I don't know, 11, 12 years old. I got a little microphone that you could plug into the thing and I would practice, I'd roll some music from one thing and I would do some introduction. And, and so, you know, part of my little journey at the cable company was eventually started doing a little talk show. Um, and I did a bit, uh, like a 30 second spot where I basically decided in like sort of rap 
hip hop fashion to take a shot at Dan York and say like, Hey, why are you listening to this old guy, Dan, who you should be listening to me. So Dan, who is a great guy ends up calling me at the cable company. Right. So I'm a, I'm like 13 years old, 14 years old. And this guy, he's like, Hey, it's Dan York. And I was like, Oh shit. And he's like, Hey, I saw your little promo. Are you going to invite me on your show or not? And I was like, well, uh, of course, I mean, that'd be great. So he's actually such a great guy. Like he responded to that by coming on my little cable and he was, you know, he was huge in Springfield. Like he was the guy came on my little cable show, promoted on his radio show. Um, and so to back way up in 1997, that led to an opportunity at WAQY in Springfield. Uh, it was a rock station with a really popular morning show. And the guys who did that morning show sort of caught that little bit and invited me to come in and and do some stuff like right around the Packers Patriots Super Bowl to come into their studio. I was like, I was again, like literally a kid. It was just a novelty. Like, let's just let this kid go in the studio and let him rip and see what happens. So I got a little taste of it there and I loved it. Like I always thought radio, it was the, it was just the coolest thing. If you were the voice on the radio and people would pick up the phone and call you and tell you why you were right or why you're wrong. You could have these great conversations. Um, and you, to me, it always felt like you're doing something that mattered. Like for society, you were hashing out stuff that mattered. I thought it was so cool. Um, so all of a sudden, 2010, all these years later, since like you started a radio show. So we were like hammered drunk and we're like, well, we got microphones and we got mixers and we could make a, we could make a thing and put it on iTunes. So we did that. Um, and it was, you know, with, with Twitter was sort of a little bit in its infancy and we had like a little presence on Facebook and I, you know, I don't know, maybe 50 people listened to it. I don't remember. It was, it was nothing. Right. But so we were podcasting and Jim Browdy, who was at New England Cable News, hosted a, a political show at New England Cable News and was on WTKK in Boston, uh, doing talk radio. We, I, I don't know if he asked or if I just uh, sort of inserted myself and said, hey, do you want to listen to this little podcast that, that Cameron and I are doing? And uh, so he listened to it and he came back the next day and he goes, it's pretty lowbrow, but you kind of got something. And uh, so he, <laughs> he set up a meeting for us with, uh, with this woman, Grace Blazer, who was the, the station manager at WTKK, uh, which was an FM talk station in Boston. And, um, you know, they kind of they they sort of dished out a little opportunity where we could do a show on Saturday nights. Um, and it was like eight to ten. You know, we were kind of I was, I built as like it was just we just try to do real talk radio. We weren't trying to be, you know, subject matter experts on anything. We would do like an hour on politics or current events, whatever was happening in the world. And then we kind of do an hour that we called like the after dark hour. We'd get into like love and sex and whatever kind of crazy stuff that people could find for us to talk about. And, it, you know, it started, it did pretty well. Um, and so we, you know, we had that cooking for like a year. We were essentially in the end buying our airtime and trying to find sponsorship to pay for it. So we initially had gone from doing a free podcast that some people listened to and whatever money we lost was just what we drank during the show to like paying for radio airtime and then like rattling a tin can to try to recoup our losses on it. But we loved it. It was the, I mean, you know, going into that studio on Saturday night to do that show in Boston was the most fun I ever had uh, in a professional endeavor. Like it just felt so cool. And it finally started to get some traction. We burned on this for like 10 months. We started to get some sponsorship. We had money coming in. We finally were like plugging the am. And then all of a sudden, right around Christmas of, I guess, Christmas of 13, um, we got the memo station is changing format. We're going to hip hop. Don't need you guys anymore. Thanks for playing. And uh, so I joke now, I'm like, we, we actually, we were like podcasting before podcasting was great. And we weren't losing a lot of money. We parlayed that into tremendous financial losses to do terrestrial radio, which was really, we were just riding the last gasp, like the last little entrails of the comet of terrestrial radio. And now everybody's podcasting. So <laughs> yeah. And like that, that story you just told, there are people in 2022, whether their percentage is as high, it's probably far lower in, than comparison to 2010 of that's their goal. Like, Hey, if our podcast gets popular enough, maybe a local radio station will pick us up or Maybe we can broker airtime or something like that. You guys caught the tail end of that, as you mentioned, what was terrestrial radio. But I feel like the lesson in that story is more about the world of non-traditional media in 2010 and where that part is. Because not only are you guys finding success with the podcast, even though the station flips and that's not unique to mass, that's happened across the country. It's not speaking to the talent or how good the show was. 
the true story that at least it feels from my end is that you guys saw the trend that was coming that audio would be on demand and people could find it the way they wanted to find it. And in particular, in that New England, Boston area in the early 2000s, we saw Barstool emerging. We saw no. talk emerging, sport. Like it felt like at that point in history, Massachusetts in particular was riding this quicker than many, any other state at that time. Yeah, it was it was an incubator. And, it you know, I think I think, you know, New England, to some extent, the capillaries like the Northeast has always sort of been, you know, when, even when it was like alternative newspapers, like in the 90s and stuff like, you know, kind of kind of led a lot of the wave. And then, you know, you're right. I mean, radio and some, you know, WBCN in Boston and some of these stations that really, uh, you know, Howard obviously came out of out of uh, Connecticut. You know, New England really is an incubator for a lot of that creative stuff and it's you know unfortunately we're there were a lot of people that just smarter than us that like leveraged it into something profitable and we were just you know kind of having having fun but um i i think you know the the cool thing about it, so we went from when when tkk cratered went to hip-hop they didn't crater they're they're still in business um but they just didn't need us. We ended up doing a deal with this station KCAA in Southern California through a connection, uh, a couple connections that I had. And so we thought, well, this is 2014. We could do a radio show in Southern California from, you know, effectively from home or Boston or wherever we were. And it was like, it was a similar deal because it was just a couple years too soon. Like doing that show remotely to the station in California Connecting to that station was like when the, like the Mercury capsule flying over Earth trying to connect to the track. You know, can you hear? Hello, hello, hello. All the static and you know, forget video. We didn't do video. Half the time we just get on the phone, and and like host uh, like two hours on our cell phone, just baking our our heads. Um, so it didn't. You know, it was one of those things where I was like, man, if this was if it had been four years later, five years later, we would have done it on zoom and it would have been all easy but so we did that for like six months and then we would you know it just it just wasn't really it was difficult to make it happen every week the show was suffering because you're constantly fighting so we at that point we we're like you know what let's let it go and and we'll try to kind of reset and do something different we'll go back to kind of our podcasting roots and you know honestly for like the last eh, five years or so we've kind of been in and out of some different opportunities to try to revive the you know the online presence the podcasting i'm i have a serious twitter addiction that uh probably should go to some form of detox or rehab for but i really i love twitter um because it like if you think about talk, like talk radio was the place where if you had something to say you know you pick up the phone and dial and it would be busy and you're like oh man i'm gonna tell this guy but this guy is really off his rocker and i'm gonna let him like, dial back in hit the read and finally get through and you get your you know 30 seconds or a minute to to go on talk radio and have your take and get it out and so you know twitter just represents like like if talk radio was just one open party line where everybody just screamed at each other it'd be twitter it's insane but it's fun and it's that same level of interaction that you know, on some level, I think it matters. I think if you're smart and you kind of care about the engagement and the conversation, like you just you, you meet really cool people and you have some good conversations. So, you know, to me, like Twitter, and I don't, you know, I, I I'm on TikTok. I don't really understand how to talk. Like I don't. I think I'm too old to effectively talk anything. But every once in a while, I post like a video of fishing or like a, if I see a train. Um, but I, I, I'm like constantly watching them because there's people, super creative people who otherwise, I don't know what all these people do, but they're not creative professionals for a living, but they make these crazy videos that are so cool. Um, so we're, like the landscape now is, you know, anybody, I mean, anybody can do it. And so, you know, if you want to, if you want to man up and throw yourself out there creatively or politically or whatever, yeah, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing stopping you. It doesn't cost a nickel. You just have to be creative and you have to put yourself out there. You know this. I love you on Twitter. I'm one of your favorite <laughs> follows. Your brother's probably told you this. Like, I'll bring my phone out when I'm hanging out with him. Be like, you see what Barry tweeted today? And he's like, Barry, Barry, my brother? What was he first day? Barry Melrose? Barry Man? No, Barry, your brother. And I'll just hold up my phone. I'm like, this is how you do it. All right. I am not Barry on Twitter. I got to figure it out because it, you had that talk background where like you just summed it up perfectly. Look, even though I don't have a microphone in front of me, even though I might not be doing this consistently as I used to, if I want to give my opinion, if I want to engage with an audience, 
if I want to have a back and forth, whether it be healthy or unhealthy, and that depends on who you're asking in those conversations, <laughs> that forum is there. And the content that can be created from Twitter and social media, sometimes you know, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok doesn't always work in that same type of discussion format. But especially somebody like you who's covered politics, who's covered different regions, like this can be just as entertaining as a 30 minute show or an hour long show like that content you're creating. And I feel like you and, and look, advice on how you use social media is variable to what you're doing for profession and everything else. But I think you use it as a tool of let's use it for what it is. It's an open forum to discuss things. And if you don't like what I'm saying, then you can block me or we can battle a little bit if we want. Yeah. And I think, I mean, the one thing that I try to do is I, you know, I don't just like when I was on a radio, I mean, I, you know, people would call up the radio show and say, you know, you're an idiot and it's all well and good, but a lot of people would call up and say, you know, they had different ideas. And one of the, like, to me, the most fun, I grew up in a crazy, my family's all a bunch of liberals. Um, you know, so I would be like, you know, the only conservative guy at like a family dinner and my family you know it's their irish family the knives come out and it's like you know but you love each other you respect each other you just don't agree so you 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 kind of learn all right i have an opinion every once in a while i'm gonna have a little sarcasm i'm gonna bite a little bit but I, the one thing i don't do whether it was radio or social media whatever, i don't take any of it personally um you know unless you threaten my family or you know some really over the top stuff that happens once in a while it's fun. It's fun, you know, and, and, and the world goes around because people have different ideas about how stuff should work. And the, the crazy thing is whether it's politics or I'm a huge NASCAR fan. So I'm like, I'm into, you know, you got NASCAR Twitter is like a whole community of uh, generally angry race fans. But, you know, if you want to, if you want to talk NASCAR, like you go on there, search the hashtag NASCAR, you could find, you know, guys like Jeff Gluck, who are, works for the athletic, who's a super talented guy. And his social media is just an incubator of constant motorsports conversation, but it's all right there. So you could, you know, you can spend 10 minutes on NASCAR. I'm going to check you know, hockey Twitter, how are the Golden Knights doing? I'm an, oh, oh my goodness, the mass mandate on the airlines got dropped. I got to get in on that, you know, so it it kind of is this like, it's just free flowing, nonstop. It's basically talk radio. And, um, you know, I think, that, like I said, just you can't take it personally, just like you're, you're on the radio, people, some people love you, some people hate you. Most people are just kind of curious, right? What you think or what goes on in your head, but you can't take it personally. Have fun. I've made made some really good friends with people on Twitter who think I'm totally nuts and out in right field, which maybe I am, but it's okay. I own it. And I, you know, people are still people and it's not personal, you know? With, so, with someone who's worked professionally in politics, though, it's not like you're just picking stuff out of thin air and throwing it on social media. You have a backing. You have a profession that you've learned stuff from, from both sides of the aisle. And you'll understand this is both a podcast and radio and news background. Has the content gotten better or is the engagement better? Like it feels like something, especially 2016, I guess might be the mark where we can set like, okay, something politically, whether it's uh, president Donald Trump, whether it's president Joe Biden, whether it's Colin Kaepernick, whether it's COVID, like even just saying those names or those things that have happened, I'm sure it, like got a reaction out of somebody listening in their car. Like it's just because, buzzwords or polarizing or whatever you want to say but has the content gotten better or do people just go for the reactions i struggled to figure that out because maybe you do too of what the hell happened the last 25 years when it came to americans in this talk of what happens in the political world yeah i'm not i'm not sure it's gotten better i think you know the the one thing that i think has changed is that if you if you're going to be on twitter and you want to try to be I mean, the word influencer, I think it's overused. We want to be active and you want to be part of these conversations. You got to be on your stuff because people are, it's, you know, in, in the talk radio world, somebody calls up and they, you know, you hit the button when they're done and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm in control of this deal. And on Twitter, you're not, you know, if you're going to get into it with somebody, whether it's, you know, it's, it's, it's greatest hits for me, right? Colin Kaepernick and, and policing issues. Cause I'm a huge back the blue guy. And I think a lot of this stuff has gone off the rails, you know, but you got to be able to have fact-based conversations. It's not about saying that Colin Kaepernick is this, or he's that it's, it's about the broader issue. And if you're going to have a conversation with somebody, you better bring something to the table. Um, so I think from that perspective, I think people are, I think people are more aware I'm not sure that they're more informed because I, I do think that part of what's happened is over the last like 20 ish years, we've become like a soundbite society. 
and it I, I think this presidential administration as much as anything you, you, you know and to some extent the last one but it's accelerated with this one you have press secretary who will stand in front of the press and just say whatever and it you know it's it's 15 20 25 seconds of you know here is what i have constructed as a message and i will deliver this message and this is the message you'll take away and you're not getting anything else and so as we've gotten more refined i think at how we communicate i think we actually do it more i think it's become less granular it's become less organic and everybody is like a communications professional crafting a press release now and so sometimes they have these great conversations but we're actually really just talking past each other because we're we're talking like we're just issuing press releases or something I, it's the soundbite society has has become more intelligent but less productive i think that's very very well said because that's kind of exactly how a lot of people are viewing this who have that professional background in media like yourself where so many people are either living for that soundbite, living for the press release, or put the blinders on where it's like, I'll only consume this. Like, I can go on Google right now, and whatever take I have about anything, I can find somebody who agrees with me. Right. And if I can find somebody who agrees with me, that validates my opinion, no matter where it comes from. And I'm sure somebody hearing that's like, oh, Gaz is a hater for the left <laughs> or the right. Like, no, no, no. Like, that's, I get a blanket statement I just tossed out there. But that is, it seems to me, and, and maybe again, someone who forms arguments and discussions for a living can kind of know where I'm going here, where sometimes if the facts aren't convenient to the argument you're having, people want to all of a sudden ignore those facts, whichever, and you can pick whatever topic you want for that. <laughs> well, I, look, and I think if you, you know, the one thing I always try to do is I, I take everything to me, I take everything for what it is. I don't look at a situation, you know, whether it's, and I, I get further and further. So I'm watching a video of police confrontation. I don't watch that to take the side of the cop or watch it to take, you know, maybe the side of a suspect who, you know, was in a confrontation with police officer. The situation plays out and it, you know, it is what it is. So sometimes you, you know, you have this like this community where, and I see a lot of times, um, you know, during the George Floyd thing, I, you know, you watch that video. I don't know. You know, I had a lot of people who would normally are cheerleaders, you know, yeah, back to blue. I'm going, nope, this, this situation is wrong. This unfolded wrong. Shouldn't happen that way. That's bad dude. Right. And so all of a sudden the people who are normally like, your people are like, you're, you know, no way you're wrong, you know, blah, blah. So I, I think if you, you know, if you want to be relevant and you want to be smart every once in a while, you have to, you have to piss off the people that normally think that you're great because otherwise you're, you're just, it's just a shtick, right? There's got to be times that you don't intellectually agree with everyone. And so even, you know, co I've been really outspoken back to when, uh, Dan and Cameron and I were doing a podcast at the beginning of COVID because we're all locked down with nothing else to do. So, you know, by April or May of 2020, I'm kind of looking at this COVID policy and I'm saying, I look, I think a lot of this stuff is off the rails. I don't see how you can order people to close down their businesses. And I, I, I had a lot of concerns from the beginning, but then fast forward to, you know, 2021. And I went out as soon as I was eligible and got the, my first dose the vaccine and you know i like you got the microchip you know bill gates tracker crazies over here and you got the people who are like we can never leave our house again over here and so there's times when you look at an issue and you're like oh thank god i'm somewhat in the middle there's actually crazies on both sides of me so i must not be crazy like yes. you sort of you sort of understand that you're you're in the middle of the river because you're not on either bank with with like the crazy crowd that's right. When you have people not calling you crazy, that's almost the best compliment you can get. Like, all right, I'll stay right here. I'll watch the craziness unfold. Sort of like we talked about the DNC and RNC. If you don't get too much into the battles in either way of that, just kind of find a safe space. You'll be just fine. That's very good. Uh, we usually close with the getting there with guys about best career advice, get what you are and everything else. For you, Barry Get Boys, I want to change this because we I've just enjoyed this politics talk so much and this media talk and this combination of these worlds you've been able to live in. And I know this is a dangerous, you already see the graphic up on, on the visual side, which is danger of what does the future of politics look like? If I could have one more grandstanding question for you before you go, but for you in particular, do you see a wave since you've seen the media landscape, the political landscape of where you think politics, whether it be the coverage, whether it be a candidacy of future people are going. And for you personally, even though you're loving Twitter, like you were ahead of the podcast, not traditional media world. That's a lot of stuff I'm tossing at you at the end here, but <laughs> Your thought in the political landscape for the next four, eight, 12 years of what we're going to see and where the future of Barry Gadboy is going to be taking us. 
Yeah, well, that's those are two very, uh, I think, distinct. Hopefully together. The, the future, the future yeah, is right. not politics. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, I don't think one. I'm there that guy. All right, um, fine. That's too, yeah, the job's too tough, doesn't pay enough. And, um, I, you know, to some extent, why we are where we are, because who actually really wants that job? I mean, you got to really be an egomaniac to put yourself through, whether you're Republican or Democrat, you got to be an egomaniac to put yourself and your family through the hell that those people go through to get there. And I think you got to sell yourself on some level, all that stuff. The The political landscape is crazy right now to me. I don't, I, I would say that if you believe in the basic tenets of politics, there's a pendulum swinging, but there's some basic things that never change. I think it's the economy, stupid. And I think to some extent, people on the left right now are discounting how much gas prices, groceries, supply chain, basic core economic issues are really affecting everyday people. Plus, I think they're discounting how much people are PO'd about what their kids have been through for the last two years in and out of school and, and some of the COVID NPIs that I think have, have endured way too long, gone way too far. You're going to find out in November. I think that there's going to be a little bit of a landslide back to um, back to the right in November. I think, you know, and it's all it's all it is waves. It's like a it's like a it's like a wave pool. Because when Trump got elected, and I'll tell you what, 2016 election night, I'm sitting there, man, I went through like a, a, a 1.75 at Tito's because it was like the greatest show I ever saw. I'm watching <laughs> this thing and the New York Times tracker is like 100% Hillary. And then the needle is coming back and I'm like, oh my God, I feel like I'm watching the WWE right now. Like, <laughs> I, think, I think Hulk Hogan just <laughs> leg dropped. Like, this is crazy. So like from the standpoint of like just theater, like it was the craziest night ever. But for people who were 1,000% in their soul sold on Hillary Clinton winning the presidency, that broke them to some extent. And then, and then COVID became, to me, the manifestation of everybody's worst fears. Like, this is what we knew was going to happen when this guy got elected. And so there's the groundswell of reaction, particularly from progressives, to COVID eclipsed the scientific situation. It became about, like the 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 emotional catharsis of like oh my god this guy got elected and now everyone's gonna die um and, and so you know now i think you see in the wave kind of breaking the other way and and you know politics in america really is to me you know about 10 percent over here and 10 percent over here are are actually driving the bus and 80 percent of us are in the middle and we generally agree on most things. I think we, you know, we we want to pay enough taxes to support our schools and have a functioning government. We don't want to pay too much. We don't want to. We don't want waste. We don't want fraud. We don't want abuse. We think that people who want to come to this country and contribute should be able to come here in some process that makes sense. But they shouldn't. We shouldn't have the level of illegal immigration that we have right now. I think people should be able to own guns. We think people probably should be able to get an abortion, even if we don't like it. Like on core issues, I think most of us are in tune. But we're really we're being led by Pied Pipers who are way on the outside. So I don't, you know, I, I think there's actually going to be a break back to the middle a little bit because the Trump politics and then the COVID politics have been so extreme. Um, but who, you know, who knows? After I remember talking to people at the beginning of COVID, I was sitting there in like April of 2020. I'm going, well, yeah, it's going to be crazy for a couple of weeks, but by the summer we'll be back on track. All this old, this will blow over. And hey, so I, at that point I was like, I'm gonna get out of the predictive game because I obviously <laughs> don't know a thing, but I, I, I think, I think that most Americans want to be in the middle. I don't think we want to fight with each other constantly. I really don't. And I don't think we have to, I think it's okay for Massachusetts be Massachusetts. California can be California. Florida can be Florida. Texas can be Texas. We can coexist. We don't all have to agree. Um, but I, I think we got to stop trying to trying to force the way that we think we should live on everybody else. I guess I'm becoming libertarian in my old age. That's no, the that's, short answer. That's very good. No, it's great. I think people are rooting for that answer to be true, whether it's families, whether it's friendships, whether it's coworkers. If we can move past that and almost find that different spot of, man, everything doesn't have to be a fight just because you vote. Republican, you vote Democrat, you vote independent, like you don't have to fight over everything. You know, sure, there's always been fighting through the history of the United States of America, but maybe not for every single issue all the time, 24 7. Every Hopefully, day. Right. Like we don't yeah. have to do that anymore. Now, even though that's potentially the future, aren't you are you excited about what it could mean for somebody like you with the history, the career, the resume of 
it seems like there's going to be more options, whether you want to get back into the media game, whether you want to continue what you're doing right now professionally. It feels like even if you're 18, 17, 22, like there are going to be options that maybe have never been presented before in the political sphere. Oh, I think I mean I you know in terms of media I you know there's two things that the the horizon's wide open, um, and I think you know to do the kinds of things that I did when I was a kid that sort of allowed me to break into certain parts of this it, it was it was hard I mean it was a lot of dumb luck um, I still go to work every day no matter what I'm doing and I act like I'm I, I in my head I'm like one step away from being fired I'm not good enough I had you know you got to push no shortcuts whatever you're doing, do it a hundred percent. Like you, you got to believe, and it goes back to being a kid around some adults who didn't want you around me. You had to prove yourself. Um, and so I go to work every day with that mentality, whether I'm coming on to do a podcast like this or whatever, you know, you got to act like you're one step away from being on the scrap heap and that, that keeps you fighting. Um, so, but now the opportunities are more open. I think between what's available on social media and the fact that you can, get a laptop and a camera and you can, you know, you can produce content that's, look, it's better than TV that we were making in the nineties and early two thousands. It's really good stuff. It sounds good. It looks good. It's engaging. Um, you know, the only question is what, because it's so accessible, how do you monetize it? How do you make a living doing it? Or do you have to, I don't know. I don't make a living doing it right now. I do it because it's fun. And, and maybe that's, part of the point too like you can you know you can have a day job or two day jobs and you can have one career you can have 10 careers you can go to college and be a phd or you can go to trade school you know be an hvac mechanic during the day and make a, a kick-ass podcast at night and that's fine like the world is really your oyster at this point so um you know i don't know the, the trick is to i think be happy with what you do and then hopefully you make enough to to eat at the end of the day you know with this being a media company with sports as the center point of it, I'm not ignoring that places, whether it be 538, The Ringer, Dan Labatard and Metal Arc Media, Outkick the Coverage and Clay Travis, they've all in some way, shape or form gone to the political world because they know that audience is there. They've gotten more traction for that. Yeah, Guys, yeah. the media is approaching the one year anniversary of this being a company. Uh, I would love to, in the future, find that right way to enter into this. We're not there yet. But I promise you this, Barry Gad boys, when I feel like the moment's right, your phone will ring. <laughs> <laughs> and I will maybe have to come out to Massachusetts with like the jersey with like your name on the back for the first recruiting pitch. So be prepared when your brother Dan says, oh, uh, yeah, Goss is coming to come get you. So be well, prepared. I All I ask, I, look, I don't know what the offer is going to be, but just answer the call and go get wings somewhere. And then you can say no to me then. But at some point. I want you over here. I will recruit you publicly right now on the podcast for it at this, some point in the future. It'd be like Theo, you know, like Theo Epstein going to Arizona to bring back Kurt Schilling. But I mean, I'll do anything for basically like a plate of wings and a pitcher of Miller Lite. So it's <laughs> it's an easy sell. If we could, if we could at some point maybe get my brother involved with something where I could talk about what a horrible organization the Red Sox are and how much you know, and let him try to make excuses for them. That might be a fun sports centric kind of conversation. But dude, listen, I love what you guys are doing. I've been, you know, I, I was a fan of what you guys were doing on the radio. Um, and then I think like a lot of people, right. I'm, I, I'm seeing news of changes coming and I'm like, man, what's going on. But I, I think, you know, in reality for where we are in 2020, this is exactly the form that you want to be in. You referenced all these other places that have taken off, you know, all they did is the same thing you did, arrange some logs around the campfire and they just had to catch the right spark and just make that, make that puppy smoke a little bit. And all of a sudden you're off and running. And I, I think, you know, the secret sauce is, you know, is your heart and your intellect and everything else. And then it just, you just have to catch the spark. You know, there's an element of luck to it, but I think this is positioned for uh, who knows what, right? And the sky's the limit. This was, we've been talking about this whole time that the landscape is wide open. I'm thrilled for the future. I'm thrilled to recruit you at some point if I don't screw this up. And I'm excited to <laughs> retweet you and roll in the DMs at 1230. Like, nice tweet, Barry. Good job. Be your number one cheerleader. Barry Gad boys, this has been months in the works. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm looking forward to talking to you again real soon. You got it, man. Anytime. DM me anytime. <laughs>